the white supremacists who own everything, by the way, that's what they call ownership. Mm -hmm. Really, they stole it all, okay? Because that's how they got their capital. That's how they got the building in the first place. That's how they got the land to build the building on, by taking it from somebody. People who, in the Northwestern Hemisphere, by their own admission, see, I'm not making a false charge, because when you make charges, you have to back them up. I'm just going by what the white supremacists told me in the eighth grade, indirectly, in the history books. That's what they call them. They said, Neely Fuller, little colored boy, sit down here and study history. Mm -hmm. I say, okay, what's history? Well, it's a record of the past, and I want you to know about some of the things that I have done in the past. And what I have done is that I took a whole lot of land from some people that I considered simple-minded, ignorant, backward, and made it my land. I killed them. I killed their children. Hmm. I killed their grandmothers. I killed them. And I forced them on little portions of land that I call reservations. I'll reserve a portion of what I took from you for you and even on that land, you're not going to be able to do anything except what I say do, which is mostly stay drunk all the time. And that's my history, and I'm proud of it. And I want this little colored boy that I've dragged his ancestors over here to do the work on the land that I took, and I want him to learn it. I was born on a slave ship, me. Personally, mm. the slave ship is the entire planet. Mm. That's the way you look at it. Because they have taken over the minds and bodies of the people on the planet. The white supremacists are the most powerful people on the planet. So the most powerful people are the people you have to look to to get whatever it is you want, whether you think you are doing that or not. But there are many what you call, quote, unquote, proud black people who have that short-sighted vision, who do not see that. They say that, I got this, I, I, I went to this university, and I studied, and I got this. Who set up the university, right. sir, or right. ma'am? Mm -hmm. I mean, stop and think about what you're saying when you talk about your great degrees that plaster your walls. Mm -hmm. well, stop and think about who gave you those degrees right. of knowledge. Now, they call it degrees. Meaning, I'm not giving you the whole thing. I'm giving you. I'm giving you. I'm not giving you 360. That that could be. I don't know. Mm -hmm. it, it comes down. It's been discussed by many many people. Why do the white supremacists practice white supremacy? I am not have not done a lot of research on that. There are people who have. And there are many, many theories. There are many concepts about why this is. But I came to the conclusion that they finally pulled it off. Mm -hmm. And that's the part that I deal with. Yes, I just sir. deal with the mechanical part. Yes. In my opinion, in the modern day, because they are already in position, see, they can do anything they want to with, with the black people now, with the non-white people. See, they, are not, they don't have any fear. See, they might have had fear when they started out, but that fear has been erased by what? Once you are in charge of everything, you're not in fear of the thing that you're in charge of. When you're trying to get in charge, that's where the fear is. Once you solidify it, now they are on a roll. So what they do now is what? Bask in the glory of what they are doing. They have already captured everybody that they wanted to capture. They're not running around trying to capture somebody that, I mean, they're still out there loose somewhere. Yes. No. They have made all of the non-white mm -hmm. people of this planet their prisoners of war. Mm -hmm. So when you are totally in charge of your prisoners of war, you're really not afraid of your prisoners of war when you can exterminate all of them. See what I mean? That's the logic. The logic says that I'm not, I don't have any fear of anything that I'm totally in charge of. See, when I say total, I mean total. So what do they really get out of this now? 
that they have achieved what they set out to do. They're not trying to achieve it. They have achieved they, they it. Have it's achieved, called yeah. white supremacy. Mm-hmm. It's mm-hmm. fun and it's glory and it's material gain. All righty. There Those is. three things, that's what they get out of okay. it. Fun, glory, and material okay. gain. And all if you just watch how they go about doing things, you know, they enjoy. Mm-hmm. When they gun some black person down, that's fun. Mm-hmm. It's like chasing foxes. Mm-hmm. Run, black person, run. Oh, mm-hmm. boy, I want you to run. Oh, oh, you think you can run away from me? You can't run far enough or fast enough to find anything to step on, because little they, black fella. They control everything. I control this entire world. Mm-hmm. Where are you going to when you run from me? Mm-hmm. When I control every place mm-hmm. that you are going to, including up under your grandmother's porch. You can't get away from me if I really want you. So I just let you run down the street, and then I shoot you, and you know, <laughs> and so what? Yeah, just- I'm in charge. Well, we are in an insane system, all right? A system of white supremacy is a system of insanity, mass insanity. Dominate and mistreating people based on color or dominating and mistreating people for any reason is a form of insanity. I mean, you know, so the system of white supremacy is the most powerful system of government and the most powerful religion have been invented in the minds of people, and it's designed to mistreat people. So you have mass insanity. Nobody can be made sane in this system, I know black. white or non-white. It's impossible to be sane in this system. So you just take for granted, we're all insane. So it's just a matter of trying to get rid of what causes the insanity. And so you have to get rid of the system of white supremacy in order to do that. Yes. And replace it with a system of justice. So even in our insane condition, the first order of business, the first step toward not being insane is what, according to logic, is to recognize that you're insane. No, 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 puppy. See, if you know that you're crazy, you're taking the first step toward not being crazy. I know black. All right. So we're all crazy. You have to understand that. Anytime you try to make sense out of what's going on around you and what your entire existence is all about, if you're trying to make sense out of it, you are getting crazier and crazier because there's no sense to make out of it. All right? Not in this system of racism that we're in. That's right. You cannot make sense out of it. And once you understand white supremacy, what it is and how it works, that's the beginning of coming out of your insane condition. Otherwise, you'll just keep getting crazier and crazier and and doing crazy things and looking forward to doing even crazier things. Mm -hmm. I know black! Well, we are... What's wrong with variety? What's wrong with diversity? Diverting from one thing to another. Well, maybe nothing, but let's examine it. Examine it for what? To see if it is an improvement over what you already had. And if so, justify it by showing, by example, where is the improvement? Which one of the, see, when you start talking about homosexuality or lesbianism, these are not just abstract words. These are talking about you have to do certain things to qualify. <clears throat> so what are these things that you do? And which one of them is an improvement over what has been done? That's yeah, just like a person might come around and say, well, hey, you know, I used to kind of be attracted to people, you know. I've had several wives and all like that. Uh, even had a little incest, I mean, every now and then, I mean, you know. And, uh, but I finally came to the conclusion that people ain't where it's at at all. I'm in the bear. Hmm. You know, you say, what do you mean you're in the bear? I'm into bear. I go out in the woods and I chase me down a bear. The bear ain't chasing me no more. I'm chasing them. 
I have found that that's a wonderful alternative. I mean, after all, man, I mean, let's face it. Look at these marriages and divorces and whatnot. I don't have no trouble with the bears. I mean, I used to didn't think of anything about bears except just going to the ball game, you know. But I found out that, man, if, if you really snuggle up to a bear, you'll never want to go back <laughs> doing nothing else. Now, where did you get that idea? Well, it just came to me one night. I'm tired of these women. In fact, people was telling me, well, if you don't like women, get you a man. Well, I'm tired of them, too. <laughs> so I'm in the bear. See, now, you might laugh, but it's going to come to that if it ain't already. Because there are some people into that. Mm. Yeah, they call it, what do you call it, bestiality? Yes, sir. Yeah, see what I mean? That might be a wholesale thing in about another 10 years. They say, oh, hey, well, you know, this gay and lesbian thing about played out, man, ain't where it's at. You know? Man, everybody's trying to preserve the bears now. You know, I'm trying to get me a panda. You know? <laughs> Now, what is the point that I'm making? It's a lots of things that the mind can do. The mind is extremely <coughs> inventive and extremely flexible. But the basic question is, is this type of activity an improvement, and if so, why? Otherwise, why are you coming around asking black people who don't even have a roof over their head that this is what they should be pushing now? Mm -hmm. They don't even have a decent school or a decent job. But now you want them to get, join the gay rights movement, and that mm -hmm. should be their priority. We should drop everything else and make that a priority. I don't yes, see sir. the justification at all. Mm -hmm. They have some uh, white people who came around years ago and started saying, calling it the rainbow, you know, kind of, uh, you might excuse the pun, tailgating. Jesse Jackson's rainbow push for civil rights. And then they got to saying, well, what is this all about? And when the question was asked, they answered by saying, well, it's another division of civil rights. Yeah. Yeah. It's all the same thing. Discriminating against gays is the same as discriminating against blacks. And a lot of mm -hmm. black people say, wait a minute. It may sound like the same thing, but it ain't the same thing. But they were able to shout all of that down. It is the same thing. Why is it the same thing? Because I said so. <laughs> White supremacy in action again. Always because I said so. See, but, you know, but that, that don't, you know, it sounds like it could be right, but it, it's something that don't still don't add up. It ain't the same thing. Mm -hmm. It is the same thing. Trust me. No different. Discrimination is discrimination which is another word that people should pay attention to. Everybody discriminates every day. You discriminate when you uh, uh, decide to ride the bicycle to work rather than catch the bus. Now, does that say that you are discriminating against the bus riders? You know? So that word discrimination, I don't even use it because everybody discriminates. It just means choosing. But what is the key? The key is... Is it a choice that's constructive? When you start talking about black people's plight now, see, that's a different thing altogether. Is it constructive or is it non-constructive? Because it's got to be one or the other. Is it an improvement? Now, we already have a mess with the male-female thing, but you would have that anyway under any system that's unjust. But now, are you making a bigger mess? Or are you straightening out all the mess that ever was? I have no reason to believe that this is helping to straighten out anything. Mm -hmm. It's helping to make it worse, particularly when you start doing it right down to the grade school level. Mm -hmm. Start saying that this is something that hey, this is just what you, you children need. You're seven years old, and this is what I need? I don't even know what sex is yet. Now you're telling me about alternatives to sex. Well, let's start out so that your mind will get straight. Now, Jane has two mommies. Thinking about getting three. 
Now, what benefit is this to Jane? Well, she learns diversity at an early age, diverting from what to what in order to do what. Oh, well, we'll, win. we'll know when we get there. Don't ask so many questions. Oh, no. I got a lot of questions. <laughs> you know, show me how this is a, a what? Improvement. Which one of these acts? See? Well, you know, being gay. Don't you understand what being gay? It used to mean being happy. I mean, you know, but that ain't what it means, I don't think, when you say it. So you're talking about acts. Show me by demonstration the very act that you're talking about that's going to be an improvement. And then show me, tell me in words how this is a great improvement. <clears throat> tell me, you know. First, do the act with me looking at you. And then after you finish the act, you'll say, now that's act one of being gay. <clears throat> you ain't gay unless you do this. See, you know, there's several things you can do to qualify for being gay. So you've got to have qualifications. Otherwise, what's the difference between you and everybody else? <clears throat> if you don't do something different. So you got to do something. So whatever that difference is, you do it. Then you get before, you know, come to the blackboard with the pointer and whatnot, and you say, now, number one, this is an improvement over whatever it is you all are doing out there. It's not just an alternative. And I'm telling you this because you should be on board for supporting act number one, which I just demonstrated to you. This is what you actually ask people to do. See, in other words, stop just talking in circles and whatnot and talking in innuendo. Get the crowd there to come and take their seats respect respectfully and then march down the aisle and come up to the podium and have your bed up there or whatever it is you're supposed to have and do what it is that you say that everybody should be taking an interest in and supporting. And then as you do it, you can turn around and face the crowd every now and then. Just take a little break. See, now, you, you saw what we just did. Now, this is an improvement over what has been because of, and then enumerate the improvements and ask for questions and answers. Because hmm. if I'm in the audience, I'm going to say, now, how is that an improvement? I just saw what you did from start to finish. I sat here and watched it for 15 minutes until you completed it. Didn't say a word. Hmm. Now, I want you to tell me how that's an improvement over what? I think that what I'll hear is silence. <coughs> but I don't know. See, because they never get that far. They just go around and say, support us. And if you don't support us, oh, you're some kind of demon. You, you're some kind of anti-something. No, just explain what you're doing. I mean, like the chief. I don't know about that fire water. You know. <laughs> How is that going to improve me? <clears throat> How is that going to be an improvement over water? Say, well, didn't you get a little buzz when you, yeah, I got the little buzz and all like that, but is it an improvement? Say, well, didn't the mountains look like you, you know, saw two of them instead of one? Wouldn't you like to have an extra mountain? Well, an extra mountain might help, but that's not really what I was looking at. I thought I was. Well, Chief, that's what whiskey does. It makes you drunk. Well, is being drunk an improvement over being sober? Well, if you work at it, <laughs> see how they talk? <laughs> and they do the same thing with sex. Now, some people have said they've seen some cartoons of my work uh, on the Internet that have been presented and that uh, it's it, pretty well embellishes what I have been trying to say in my textbooks. And uh, to the extent that it does that, well, that has been, from what I understand, some people reported to me a plus, because they didn't understand what I had written very well, but when they saw those cartoons that just repeated what I was saying, and attaching my name to it and uh, came right out of the book the material did uh, they say that they better understood it and I can understand that because people are kind of visual particularly in the year 2021 now uh, 
more visual than ever. People are used mm -hmm. to looking at things on the screen. They are supreme. I didn't say better. Supreme just means, hey, they can tell you what to do and you can't tell them. That makes them supreme. That's what white supremacy means. They can tell you what to do, but you can't tell them. You can't make them do nothing. And they'll challenge you if they, you know, of course we usually don't challenge them. We'll stand there when we're mad and say we demand, but that's not really what we mean. We mean, we, we really mean we're asking in a loud voice, because we can't demand nothing. Because see what the, you know, when it comes right down to it, when they back up and say, okay, you say you are demanding, you're going to make me do what you want me to do? All right, do it. Say, come on now. Say, now you do this among your own people, you get away with it, but you, you're dealing with a master now. Make me. All this stuff you're talking about that you got to have, make me. You're intelligent. You said that you are. You said your people are this and that, and you come from a long line of this. Make me. None of us have proven that we can meet that yet. None of us. In all these years, some of us can talk pretty loud, you know, and we can do a job on each other like you wouldn't believe. But when Master Man says, make me, we melt. And the evidence shows it. Now, does that supposed to make us real feel real bad and crawl under a rock and all like that? No. That's what makes you strong. Why? According to logic. To admit that you're a prisoner of war is strength, if that's what you are. That's the first step toward not being a prisoner. Realize that you are one. But see, black, black males in particular, we like to flex our muscles. Boy, do we ever like to act like we are really men. And we will slaughter each other on 8th Street out there any day in the week to prove it. We ain't nowhere close. Because when the real man comes around, we melt. You see us running across parking lots and hiding under cars. When we were real men, we'd meet him halfway. We'd say, where is it? You ain't saying nothing but the word. Where is it? Point to which way he's coming from. All right? <laughs> no. It could be. But I'll respond because uh, some people think that that is really significant. And it mm -hmm. may be significant. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's very significant. And I'll give Why my not? logical, compensatory, counter-racist, logical reason. Uh-huh. The white supremacists sometimes themselves say, you know what? A lot of black people were here before we got here. We came out of caves. We came out of caves like, and they don't use this expression, but they kind of imply like, it was five minutes ago. We just got here five minutes ago. You black people have been here on the planet for zillions of years. Mm -hmm. But boy, look at us now. So what does that say about you? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And they got a point there. They got a point there. Mm -hmm. See, it's not like how long you have been here. It's what you do while you've been here. That's what counts. Any teacher in any classroom will tell you that. That's pure mathematical logic. A teacher will walk into a classroom and say, Willie, how long have you been in this school in the first grade? And Willie will say, I've been here in the first grade since I was six years old, and I'm 32 now. What does that say about Willie? And here comes little Johnny, and he spends 10 minutes in the first grade, 
and after 10 minutes, he's ready to graduate into postgraduate college. Why? Because that's what we're really saying. When black people start getting on that high horse and talking about how long they've been here, see, it's not how long you've been here. People can sit on a rock for millions of years. That doesn't count for anything. The earth is nothing but a big rock with some foliage on it. Yes, and all of the generations that have come up since the beginning of white supremacy. Now, that doesn't say that black people weren't doing things that they shouldn't do before that system. But all of the people who are breathing now have come up under the system of white supremacy. So we don't know anything else other than what they teach us. We can't even claim that, you know, we know something that they don't know. See, that's how you measure that. What is it that black people know about that the white supremacists don't already know? I can't even name one thing, even though black people will say we have our schools and we have our own way of doing things and we got our style and all like that, and that we know all about how to, you know, cultivate hair, and we know all about, you know, this, that, and other that we do, and uh, this is a black thing. We even had an expression for it. This is a black thing. You wouldn't understand. There's nothing that the white supremacists don't understand about their slaves. That's why they're slaves. They have a better understanding of their slaves than the slaves have of themselves. That's why they're slaves. Because if they had a better understanding of how slavery worked and how white supremacy worked, they wouldn't be subject to white supremacy. That's the mathematical equation. If you are smarter than the people that dominate you, you are not going to be dominated. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's the mathematical equation. Now, a lot of people are very, very unsettled with that. A lot of black people say, oh, no, you can't, you can't go around saying that they're smart. Oh, oh, don't say that. Don't say that. That makes me feel bad. Well, regardless of how you feel about it, is it true? Well, I simply say that white supremacy is the most powerful of all of the religions when it comes to non-white people. Non-white people try to practice a number of religions, Judaism, Christianity, Hinduism, Islam, Buddhism, Confucianism, uh, black Mormons, uh, I guess somewhere maybe uh, black Amish people or non-white, uh, you know, uh, Amish people. Uh, there might be some groups of people who are like that. But the white supremacists have the strongest and most powerful religion. And they go around and examine all of the dark people of the world okay. to see what religions they are practicing or what religions they say that they are trying to practice. Christianity, Judaism, Islam, etc., 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 plus all of the hundreds of tribal religions. Some of them, you know, names I can't even recognize right. and whatnot. But they say that these are their religions. Okay. And so the white supremacists will examine everybody's religion who is a person of color. Okay. And they will see if there's anything in that religion that's a danger to the religion of white supremacy. And they will say, oh, you're going to have to take that out of your religion. And so far, it has been proven, and you can check and see, that the non-white people always take that part out of their religion. Okay. And the white supremacists tell them, so then, what you better do. So then the answer... I, I don't agree with that part of your religion, because that's bad for my business. Okay. I'm simply saying, in simple terms, the white supremacists, if you're black, will come and look at whatever your religion is, and they will say, okay... You can do this, you can do this, you can do this, you can do this, you can do everything except this, 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 okay. and this. Okay. And then if I'm practicing what I call my own religion, I'll say, well, wait a minute, but you're messing up my religion. I mean, you just can't come and do that. And they will say, oh, I can't? Well, you violate what I just said. You, you in practicing your religion, says thou shalt do this and thou shalt do that and all like that 
in any of the areas of activity, economics, education, mm. sex, or whatnot, you got these religious things that you say that you practice uh, that is involved in sex, and you are a person of color, you're a black person, and you say your religion tells you not to do this when it comes to sex, I'm telling you to do this when it comes to sex. Okay. Or are you going to be in trouble with me? Oh, okay. Now, yeah. you know, you, you I, don't, I don't care about you or your God. You don't get in trouble with me, boy. Woo! Or girl. Okay. I mean, so you take this out of your religion. If I catch you trying to practice this part of your religion, I'm going to come down on you with both feet All right. and everything else, and you know it. Okay. And so the average black person, it has been proven, the average person of color says, what? Yowza. Yowza. We don't say it in those words. We don't verbalize right. it and all, but we very quietly don't do that anymore. Why? Because the master of the supreme religion on this planet among the people said so. Because anything that people put together, people can take apart. And that's been true proven all through nature. All you have to do is just study the natural order of the universe. Fire will burn, water is wet. Now, you've seen buildings put up. 1786, the building is built. And they decide that they're going to make a shopping center or something where that building is sitting. That building can come down in 15 minutes, even though the building was built 200 years ago. You've seen that happen right before your very eyes. Anything that people put together, people can take apart. But you'd have to know how it's put together, and you have to address how it's put together. You can't keep chipping away at something down the street and thinking that you're uh, disturbing something that's three blocks away. That's not logical. But that's how black people have been taught to think. We don't see the whole picture. We just see parts of a picture. So we're just chipping away at little edges here and little edges there. And so somebody said something, they called me a name when I went in that store. And so therefore, I'm not going to that store anymore. I'm going to all the other thousands of stores other than that one. And all of the other thousands are the same store. We have to realize that. It's like trying to find another a comfortable spot on a slave ship. Sure, you might find one, but you're still on a slave ship. And the rats and roaches and whatnot, I mean, all over the ship. So you're going to get bitten wherever you go, wherever you go on the planet. There's one system of government on this entire planet unless I'm not telling the truth. And I always ask people, don't believe anything that Neely Fuller says ever. Check it out yourself. Go and put it to an acid test and see if it's true. Because I've talked to people, I haven't been very many places on the planet, but I will say this, I have talked to people who have been to many places on the planet, and they say, well, anywhere you go, when it comes to this color thing, it's real. It's real. You may not see it right away, but if you hang around a little while, you'll see it because it's there. It's nowhere to run, folks. And you're going to be insulted everywhere you go. we got to understand that. Until what? Until we replace the system of white supremacy with the system of justice. And that's our job. We can't wait for somebody else to do it. That's what we should be thinking about. because, see, it's just one religion that really counts, and that is the religion of white supremacy. All of the other people are tempted to practice their religion. Most people who have a religion are very, very sincere, you know, and they prove it by their actions and whatnot up until the time that the white supremacists step forward and say, well, now, you can practice this part of your religion, you know, if you want to have a pig, neck or something like that, I don't mind that. You know, if you want to clap your hands or you want to sing and whatnot, I don't mind that. Uh, just help yourself. That's not bad for my business. 
But if I want to kill people and all like that, you better not start saying, Thou shalt not kill, and then start interfering with me while I'm doing my, mm -hmm. or I will kill you. And they have proven that they will do that. Mm -hmm. And people fear that. And they let people know. Now, you yeah. have as many gods as you want. But when I tell you to do something, you better jump. Like I'm your God. Because for all practical purposes, I am. Now, you might have a God in heaven, but I'm the one who rules you on this planet. So you can sing about after you're dead all you want to. Just don't mess with me while we're both walking around on the same planet. Because this is my planet. You don't own none of it. And you don't have anybody anywhere in the spiritual world or the material world that can help you when I get on your case. And most people, so far, have backed down when the voice of the white supremacist is coming to the picture. And some of them haven't backed down. And most of them who didn't back down are dead. We're not thinking about what's coming at us at all because most people don't even have an idea that such a thing as white supremacy exists. When it controls everything, if you're black, everything that you're doing, the white supremacists control. Even when you think that you're controlling something, the average black person wakes up in the morning and say, well, I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that. Well, you're going to do this and you're going to do that on whose terms? I mean, when you walk out your door and the street that you walk on, who determines what street that you are going to be on, even when you walk out what you call your door? Because your door might not even be your door. Your door may be something that you owe somebody for. Have you thought of that? You hmm. say, this is my door. This is my house. Is it really? Hmm. When you stop to think, who really owns your house? Are you beholden to anybody? I mean, is this a house that you built on the street that you built in the place that you decided it would be? Or did was the place already there and somebody told you it might be a good idea for you to go over there and take a look and then move in? Move in on what? On whose terms? On your terms? Not likely on somebody else's terms. And who is that somebody else, ultimately? Who is it? Have you ever asked? Have you ever thought about it? Do you really control your existence on this planet? You're the average black person, particularly black males. You know, we got this thing about, you know, physicality. If I take off my shirt and I got big bulging muscles, I mean, somehow... That's a cure-all for everything in the world. I'm a black male, and I got strong muscles. I can lift weights, and I can run down the street faster than anybody else and get where I'm going. Uh, that somehow makes me a strong black man, and that's all I need. I got these bulging muscles. I'm, I'm fit and I'm trim. I love to take my shirt off, particularly you know in the summertime and whatnot. I don't want to wear a shirt at all. I take my shirt off so people can see my strong muscles. Okay. And I can lift things. I can go here and I can go there. But have you ever stopped to think about what you can use your muscles for? Or against? And what's the product? Hmm. Is this all that you have? Do you have anything else to show? for your being on this planet up to now? Do you have a plan for the future hmm. that goes beyond just you taking up the sidewalk, making people walk around you when you come down the sidewalk because you're in the middle and they have to go past you, the latest with the baby strollers and all like that because you are, hey, your own man or are you really a man? Because the people who, when Martin Luther King was assassinated, there were a lot of strong males, strong black males. But 
I, I, I tend to believe they were people who understood their position in the system of white supremacy. That's why they had signs. Now, these are people that lift garbage pails. You've got to be strong to do that. But they had signs saying what? I am a man. People right now can go to their computers and punch up the day that Martin Luther King was assassinated, April 1968. And there in Memphis, Tennessee, Martin Luther King was there to tell, to help the garbage workers, who were all black, I understand, to get higher wages. And these garbage workers, these sanitation workers, proud people, people who, uh, many of them, I mean, were, you might call it that day, uh, pillars of the community and in the church and all like that. But they were sanitation workers. But they were also saying, yeah, even though we're sanitation workers, we should be getting a decent wage. But they didn't have signs saying we should be getting a decent wage. They had signs saying almost in unison. There are photographs of it. as a historical record saying what? I am a man. M-A-N. Like Muddy Waters even had a song saying man, man, you know. Right. Over and over again. And when black people, and they don't say it so much nowadays, they say dude, but black people used to use the word man all the time back in the 40s and 50s. Why? Right. You had to keep saying that to kind of reassure yourself that that's what you should be. You should be treated like a man. You know, I'm a man. I mean, don't be calling me no boy. I'm a man. You say boy this and boy that. I'm tired of hearing that. You know? I mean, even when black people would say it to each other, hey, boy, you know, hey, well, you know, man, uh, hey, I'm a man. I'm three times seven. That was a common saying. Three times seven. That makes me 21. You know, I'm a man. And if you don't believe I'm a man, I'll prove it to you. you know? Meaning I will do harm to you physically. That's what it meant in the old days. But see, black people had to keep saying that to each other. And find that they had to start saying it to white people, but the white supremacists said, it's only going to be one man on this planet. And you boys who want to be men, I tell you what, after Martin Luther King is dead, I'll make a deal with you. Hmm. You'll go from boys, you'll go from boys not to men, you'll go from boys to women. To women. Yes. I will degenderize you and get you to love it. You'll love acting like your sisters and love being that way and go around looking for another male to do things with you in the bed like you're a female. We're not being taught that. We're told that. I mean, that's, that's, an assumption. that's not an assumption we just made based on evidence. Those who say that We've been taught, you know, you hear it all the time. You're in control. You're in control. You can be anything that you want to be. Anything that you want to be, you can be it. And that may be theoretically true. But if you're black and you're on this planet, you're going to have to deal with the white supremacists in anything that you want to be that's worth being. Now, anything that's not worth being, any, any type of silliness, any type of foolishness, any type of dangerous activity, anything that's tacky or trashy or terroristic, you can do that because that's all been authorized. But anything that's going to be constructively productive in a concerted way, in a focused way, in a clear way, in a steady way, the white supremacists will come around and say, oh, no, <laughs> if you're going to do anything, there's a real improvement, something that's really a breakthrough and really constructive. You're going to have to get my permission to do it, and I ain't giving my permission. And if you don't like it, fight me. I'll challenge any of you because I'm an expert at violence. You people think you know something about violence on the south side of Chicago. Have you ever seen me when I really get in a violent mode? All of you black people all over the planet, you think you know something about violence, you get in my face. I invented violence. I'm the master of violence. 
I teach violence all the time. I teach it to you. The AK-47s that you have, you get them from me. And don't you forget it. You're totally helpless when it comes to anything in economics, in education, in war, trying to run a family and whatnot. You don't have a family. I'm in charge of your families. I'm in charge of your entire village. I'm in charge of what you call your entire country. I run everything. You don't move on the ocean without me, without my permission. Mm -hmm. I know where you all are. I mean, I have planes in the air all the time that can watch watch you when you're trying to uh, uh, put a needle, uh, put some thread on a needle. I know when you're doing it because I invented the thread and the needle. And even if I didn't invent it, I took it over. So don't start talking to me about your inventions either. Because whatever you have, I have. Because I took you, which means I took everything that you have, including all your ancient knowledge that you claim that you have. And so this is why in, in the book that I wrote, I say black people shouldn't brag about anything. We should be out of the bragging business altogether. I mean, I mean, like almost forever into infinity. Because we have lost everything, if we ever had anything worth having. We have lost it under the system of white supremacy. We are not in a position to brag about anything. And when we do, we come under, we come under that silly ban banner. Because the white supremacists would look at us and say, what are they parading about? What are they bragging about? Look at their condition. Look at the condition of, of what they call their families. Look at, they beg us for everything. They're not in charge of anything. Not one thing are they in charge of. But they have time to brag. We have really done an excellent job on them. Let's keep doing it. Now, if I understand the question, have I been harassed? Yes. Because of my book? No, I haven't. What okay. has happened is I've been ignored. So I say, yes, I've been harassed in that that way see the white supremacists are very shrewd when they believe that and, and this is just my belief when they believe you are right on point and that they're allowing you to be on point the first thing they do is not pay attention to you and that's anybody not just me they pay attention to who's listening and seeing if anybody is listening and acting on what you're saying and if they check that out and see that nobody is acting on it because nobody really understands what you're doing or not interested in what you're doing or what you're saying and not acting on what is being said. That's the main thing. They look for the action. They don't care about the theorists. You can talk about, you can have all the theories you want to. You can stand and make speeches all day. I mean, every day, you know, they don't care. What they do is what's going to be the result. So, so far, they have looked at the results of my work and they say nobody's paying any attention to him so <coughs> we won't mention him and the other people are not mentioning what he's doing or his book which is what it is it's not about him it's mm -hmm. what he wrote mm -hmm. nobody's acting on it so so what in other words it's just like any criminal enterprise if you know if nobody's chasing us if, if, you know, people are talking about we are doing stuff we shouldn't be doing, but nobody's doing anything about it. Nobody's, you know, they, they have analyzed it, and, you know, and they talk about it. They say we're running this criminal operation and whatnot called white supremacy, but uh, it's not taking any effect. Our slaves still go about doing what they always do, you know, just get up in the morning and try to entertain each other. You know, that's most of what black people do, entertain each other and whatnot. So everything is, you know, business as usual. We're right on course. We don't worry about nobody like Neely Fuller or nobody else. You know, doesn't make any difference who it is. Martin Luther King and whatnot, I mean, he got to be a problem. All right? So when you, like in any criminal operation, see, when something gets to be a problem, mm -hmm. uh, maybe we have to whack somebody. Mm -hmm. you know? Maybe we have to take care of somebody. We have to put a hit on somebody. And we'll put a hit on, uh, you know, 
And we got different ways of putting hits on people. I mean, uh, you know, we just let Marcus Garvey just, you know, go back to Jamaica and die quietly. After he started his steamship line, he thought he was on a roll. He had people marching in the streets and whatnot back mm -hmm. in the old days and mm -hmm. all like that, talking about Negro improvement, whatnot. But he died a broken person, and uh, we saw to that. And, uh, you know, and, uh, okay, you got another one coming up? Okay, Malcolm X or whomever, we'll be ready for him, too. I mean, you know, when, we know when to knock him down, okay? We don't like to put hits on it, you know, like Solazzo said in the movie The Godfather, you know, I don't like blood, Tom. Uh, you know, blood is a big expense, all right? In other words, it attracts too much attention and whatnot. So we don't, you know, we don't want to beat up black people in the street, not in the refinement stage. A lot of us do, but some of us that get out of line, even the white supremacists put them in their place. So you're bad for business. Yes. You're around here, you know, yelling the N-word all up and down the street. You don't want to do that. We're trying to be refined. We got a smooth operation here. We got these black people eating out of our hands. We got them doing all doing all kinds of stupid stuff. Mm -hmm. That's what we want them to do. Be devoted to stupidity, twenty four seven. And we 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 got generations of them now, a couple of generations, maybe three or four, just devoted to wholesale stupidity. Just walking around doing stupid stuff all day long, mm -hmm. worshiping stupidity. <laughs> That's the way we want That's them. And you around here calling them the N word, you gonna make them get smart. Mm. We don't want no smart black people nowhere on this planet. So wow. even though you are white, we're gonna put a hit on you mm -hmm. if you keep doing it. And they do that. They kill each other. Uh -huh. They uh think nothing of it uh if you're bad for business. All right. And you're white. Uh, okay. I mean, you know, hey, don't don't run around here calling these people the N word when I got them working for me for nothing. Okay. And then you're going to stir them up. If they notice that I'm using that kind of language about them, they might start noticing other things I'm doing to them. And when you're subject to a system where the system is designed to be insulted, and that's the system of racism, and all non-white people are subject to that system, that's my... Uh, evaluation, then you can expect to be insulted each and every day, either directly or indirectly, even when you don't think you're being insulted, even when the insulting language is not used. You're still being insulted by being subject to an insulting system, because a system of racism is insulting, and that's the only system that we have ever known. And when I say we, I mean the people who are classified as non-white. The white supremacists, and they are, that's the correct title for them, of this planet, are the dominant political and religious force and economic force, if you want to use the term economics, I don't use it within that context, but they are the dominant people on the planet when it comes to non-white people. So non-white people can expect we shouldn't get jolted when we insulted or call names, anything like that. Uh, you, you can't, you can't, there's no way to pretty it up anyway. And when people do try to pretty up an incorrect system, then they are going more into the realm of illusion. And that is going to engender more frustration, confusion, and ultimately disappointment and anger. Because you can't walk around trying to evade reality. We're in a racist system. We are not in any other system. Racism is not something that people encounter every now and then. We are in a racist system. The entire system is racist. There's no part of the system that is not racist in every area of activity economics, education, entertainment, labor, law, politics, religion, sex, and war. Now what does that mean? It means that the people who have chosen to be racist, meaning white supremacists, have become 
the most powerful political and religious people on the planet when it comes to non-white people. People who are classified as black, brown, red, yellow, tan, beige, etc., etc. And so therefore, that's an insult in system. And so black people have gotten to the place, particularly in the modern times, since what we call the post-chattel slavery. Black people expect to be respected. That's why black people kill each other, many of them. Many of the younger black people more than anybody. About this thing called dissent, or being disrespected. You're in a disrespectful system. And all the killing that black people do among each other all the time, saying you're disrespecting me, therefore I have to kill you so that you won't disrespect me anymore. And then you run right into the same thing again and again and again. How many bodies can you stack up? Because you are being disrespected in a disrespectful system. If you're classified as black, you're not supposed to be respected. You're on a slave ship. The entire planet is a slave ship. It's not called that, but that's basically what it is. And the destination of that ship is just its own destination, meaning subjugation to the system of racism. There's no black person anywhere on the planet who is not subject to the system of racism. So you wake up in the morning, go through the day, and go to bed that night and all through the night while you're asleep you're being disrespected you're being insulted because you have been put into a prison based on your color that is one of the biggest insults not only that a person can receive but it's really a slap in the face and an attempted insult to the creator of the universe but the white supremacists don't care about that They don't mind insulting the creator of the universe. They'll say, I don't like your creation. You made all these black, brown, red, and yellow people and put them among me. I'm supposed to have the planet to myself. And since they're here though, I will insult them and I will kick them around. Your product, even though I am your product, I don't want to be bothered with these other products that you made. So actually, they are not only at war, with the black people of this planet. They're at war with their creator and with ours. Unless I've been misinformed. Or anything that non-white people do, that's the way you look at it, that is of constructive value. I tell people anytime you're doing anything of constructive value, you're hurting the system of white supremacy because no person of color is supposed to do or say anything that makes sense. I mean, so anytime any people who have color in their skin do anything that has constructive results, something beneficial that helps people to think constructively or to act constructively rather than non-constructively, you are hurting the system of white supremacy. The white supremacists want the entire world of people of color to always do stupid things. And many uh, people of color, black people in the Northwestern Hemisphere, uh, under the system of white supremacy, we are taught to worship anything that's stupid. Just go and find something stupid to do. And do as much of it as we possibly can do. And walk around bragging about it. All right? That's how we have been taught. We're systematically taught to do that. And in a school, I mean, the the young male or female who is black in an all-black school is kind of ridiculed, I have heard. Because I have certainly witnessed it and and, uh, not as much as, in the old days when I was coming up, people were more constructive than I understand that they are now. Yes. Then in a lot of the schools, you, know, you can't learn anything of constructive value because the person who is trying to learn something and do something of constructive value is ridiculed. 
and by the other students who want to do something that doesn't make sense at all. Now, they didn't get that naturally. That's something that's been taught to them indirectly by the white supremacists. And the answer to the persons who asked that question about the rise of people who are trying to, of people of color, who are trying to do something more and more of constructive value, learn how to build a locomotive, learn how to plant better crops, learn how to go into the ground and uh, come up with an irrigation system where they can have clean water and whatnot. The white supremacists don't want that. They want control of all of that. Anything of constructive value, they want control of it. All, tin, gold, anything that might be used constructively. They want to keep control of that. They don't want non-white people anywhere to have control of anything that makes sense. But anything that's a bunch of garbage, anything that puts fills a person's mind with garbage, if that person is black, the white supremacist is all for that. I mean, nothing but just open a, the top of a black person's head and just pour garbage in, this nonstop garbage and then put the cap on it and have them walking around doing garbage stuff all of their entire existence until the white supremacists come around and beat them over the head and make them do something for the system of white supremacy that makes sense. Now, they will help a black person do something that's going to help the system of white supremacy, but the minute you do that, or are not doing that, rather, if you're black on this planet, the minute that the white supremacists turn you loose from doing something constructive for them, then they want you to go off and do something that's non-constructive for yourself. And we just see that in little things like, you know, as far back as you can remember, like I alluded to earlier in this, in this program. You can come on a job, and on that job you're doing something constructive that the white supremacists want you to do. You're building things, you're repairing things, you're cleaning things, and the white supremacists want that. It makes them comfortable, and it makes you comfortable, all right, if you're a person of color. But the minute the white supremacists say, okay, you can go now and do some of the things, you know, that you want to do, but they have us trained that when we leave their presence, we immediately start doing what? Like in the old days, like I said earlier in this program, get off the job and do what? Go right down the street to the whiskey store. Buy some whiskey. That's what we used to do in the old days. And get what? Drunk. drunk. Yeah, do something stupid. And if you have drunk, go and stab somebody, shoot somebody of color right there in your own neighborhood. Mm. And the only time you stop doing it is when the white supremacist said, okay, that's enough of that now. I mean, you know, Saturday and Sunday, we gave you time to do all that stupid stuff. Now, this is Monday, you come back and start doing something constructive for me. Yes, sir. Not for you, but for me. But when you're off on your own, make sure that whatever you do when you're around your cousins and your so-called friends and your neighborhood, I mean, you know, you go out and do your gang banging then and all like that. Do, do a whole bunch of stupid stuff wherever you are. Yes, sir. But when you come over on this side of town where I am, that's the only time in your entire existence that you do something that makes sense. And let's keep it that way. Well, to the extent that the white supremacist has anything to do with anything that black people do, they do things that are harmful to black people. That's the answer. The prisoners of war are supposed to be harmed the way that they think. You got color in your skin, you are eligible to be dominated and mistreated. That's what you are born for. That's what they are taught. I mean, it's not even personal. It's just built into the system of government, world government that if a person has color in his or her skin in every area of activity, find a way, if you're white, 
if you're classified as white, have been, quote, unquote, fortunate enough to have been born white, part of your duties, one of your main duties, is to walk around on the face of this earth, and if you encounter, either deliberately or just incidentally, people of color, particularly people classified as black, of the non-white people, you are automatically supposed to think of a way, regardless of whatever else you are thinking about. If you are classified as white, you are supposed to automatically say, yon goes a person with color in his or her skin. Now, as a duty, as a white person, it is my duty to kind of figure out a way to get over there where that black person is and figure out a way that you can do some type of harm to that person. Period. That's the way they are taught. That's the way we all are taught. Black people are taught to treat each other that way. By whom? Directly, indirectly. Through the books and all like that, and through the use of the word dark and black, you know, and the way the word is used, uh, that is outlined in the code book in the Word Guide, and in the basic textbook. The way the word has been used, dark or black, something evil, something, you know, that, hey, what is that? Uh, throw rocks at it. Uh, stop it from moving. Uh, and if you're not going to stop it from moving, it, watch it while it moves and see if it does anything that you can find a way to disapprove of and then take action against it. Now, when you see yourself that way, you're seeing yourself the way that the white supremacists and most white people on this planet have been taught from birth to react at the sight of a person who has color. The darker, the more foreboding, the more Halloween, the more walking dead, the more ghoulish, the more grotesque that thing is. Something that brings horror, something that is a terrorist, something evil. They're taught that. So you're supposed to understand that. All right. Claude Anderson, he recently said it was almost a mind-blowing point. Claude Anderson said that when black people kill black people, we're actually emulating white people. Absolutely. I mean, he's not the only one to say that. I mean, hundreds of books have been saying I've been saying it. I mean, and black people know that. Black mm -hmm. people get up in the morning, a lot of black teenagers all over the world now, and particularly in the Northwestern Hemisphere, it's completely self-evident. This is what all the locks on the doors are about. This is why walking down the street is dangerous. It's because we have got black people walking around all day long looking for an excuse because we're trying to, particularly black males and a growing number of black females, looking for a way to prove that we are somebody. And the way that we do that is you do harm to another person of color. Some, find somebody that looks just like you and try to, hey, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get all over that thing. I'm going to kill that thing. I mean, that thing shouldn't even be here. You know, I shouldn't be here, but I ain't got nerve to kill myself, so I kill him because he looks like me. That's a reflection of me. That reminds me of me, and I can't stand myself, so why could I stand him? And that's why we kill each other by the bushel all over the world as we're speaking right now. Mm. And we call it tribalism. We give it all kind of names. Well, you ain't a member of my gang. Yes, you are. <laughs> You're all fellow prisoners, that's all. But you got prison gangs, all right? And the warden says, well, hey, let them kill each other. I mean, hey, the less burden on the taxpayer. <laughs> you know, we're tired of running ambulances for these Negroes. <laughs> mm -hmm. Uh, you said black people need to stay away from each other. Since you brought up black people in your last statement, um, why did you say that black people need to stay away from each other unless 
there's going to be some productivity. Yes. Black people should stay away from each other because as victims of racism, the races have filled our minds full of poison. So whenever we come in contact with each other, the poison immediately begins to spread. Black people walk around full of poison. You can almost see it in our eyes when we pass each other on the sidewalks. We're loaded with it. It's been put there. We weren't born with it. We didn't have that look in our eyes when we were little people, just little toddlers. We were wide open to the world, just like all people are when you're a toddler. But when you are in an evil system, a system that is designed deliberately to produce evil thoughts, to produce animosity, to produce violence, then that toddler, as he or she grows, begins to pick up the poison that's already here. And then the poison is spread as that person comes in contact, particularly with persons of like persuasion. This is why black people sitting on a bus, you can almost feel the atmosphere of hostility there. That's not a natural thing. That's artificial. And it's all put there by the white supremacists long before the bus was built, long before the people got on the bus. Every black person must realize this. So what do you do about it? Codification is all about what you do. You make sure that anything that you say to someone before you open your mouth is of constructive value. Anything that you do with someone you sit down and plan it first and make sure that what you are planning is of constructive value. Otherwise, black people should go the other way when they see each other. They shouldn't even come in contact with each other. They should cross the street almost before they say anything to each other because once they say anything, the poison starts unless they already have something in mind to say that is of constructive value. And we just tried this. This is what you call the process of counter-racist codification. You're working against racism right there. But see, black people just cannot continue to do like they're doing, and that is wait until they make contact and then try to figure out what to say and what to do, and it comes out all messed up right from the jump. As we well know from experience, we should have learned that by now. So we should agree that... We avoid each other. Avoid each other like we are carrying SARS. That's what I was going to say, uh, put in the terms of uh, that we're, we're carrying viruses. Yes. Yes. There is such a virus as, you know, social viruses that we send, messages that we send with eye contact, with everything. This is why you'll find a black person who will gun down someone with a 9 millimeter in a line in a grocery store about nothing but a look. Mm -hmm. We're so full of poison, we're loaded with it. So if we back off from each other, avoid each other, and say, now I'm not going to say anything to this person that I see coming a block away unless it's something constructive. Otherwise, I'm going to avoid eye contact and every other kind of contact. See, now, there is a governor on black people where that poison doesn't take place, and that is when that bl same black people, two black people coming down the street, they will start building up poison for each other a block away. But when they come in contact with white people, the poison is nullified because they know that white people can put a hurting on them. They know where power really is. Unless, of course, they happen to corner some white person off somewhere in an alley or something. Mm -hmm. But black people don't have that automatic poison rising to the surface because the poison hasn't been put there for them to have that kind of animosity toward white people. Now, that's not to say that it should be there, but the poison shouldn't be there at all. Black people should be like Mr. Rogers when it comes to interacting with each other. <laughs> Is this subconsciously, uh, subconscious, that we have this poison in us and, and that are not aware of it? 
I, I know that uh, the answer to the question, but I have to pose the question to you. We are not only aware of it, we have come to glorify it. Black people wake up in the morning thinking about how we can spread poison among each other. Consciously and we call or it, subconsciously? We, it's, it's, well, it's conscious, because now it has become the black lifestyle. We call it the ghetto lifestyle. We call it the black community lifestyle. It is a major disaster of the planet. Major. This is why we slaughter each other all over the planet in huge numbers, just like it's nothing at all. It's nothing like the sound of the 9 millimeter, one of Adolf Hitler's favorite cartridges. Hitler's been long dead. And he is reported to have not cared very much for black people. But mm -hmm. one of the bullets that came out of World War II was a 9 millimeter cartridge. And it is being used everywhere among black people and glorified as the principal instrument for spreading poison and making death among black people wherever they happen to be. The sound of the 9 millimeter in the night. Pow, 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 pow. Glorified and enjoyed by many black people wherever they happen to be. It is a total universal disgrace. But we have that. So how do you avoid it? Avoid contact. A bunch of black people getting together, 10 of them, with no constructive agenda, always means something ugly. Always. No constructive agenda pre-plan in detail the million man march worked because it was pre-planned so and what about it was of constructive value and so everyone the understood that what it is the not church? something that's in the people uh by nature uh -huh. it's something that's carefully planted there so you can plant you can remove that if no more than just temporarily by having a plan Say now, when everyone does this, when we all come together, the agenda is as follows. Everyone will deport themselves with decorum. There will be no throwing down of trash. Mm -hmm. And if you happen to throw some down or see some that's been thrown down, pick it up and put it in a receptacle. Now, see, this is a pre-plan. Now, black people work very well. This is why the churches, for the most part, work. When black people come to church, they have a code. That's what I was going to ask you about the black so church. So black people, well, right. when black people at least come to church, they at least have an agreement in advance. Mm -hmm. But we're going to kind of act like, for a few hours, we have some sense. Mm -hmm. Unlike the way we acted when we before we came in here, even though when we leave here, we're going to revert to type. But for two or three hours... We're going to go according to the little code that we have set up about the way you conduct yourself doing these services. And so that's just a little respite. <laughs> what about religion? Well, religion is nothing. Uh, here again, you define what is a religion. It's a strong belief backed up by action. Okay. Now, the strongest religion on the planet is the religion of white supremacy. Now, a person might say, well, white supremacy is not a religion. Yes, it is. It's a strong belief backed up by action that has a God. Well, what is the God of a white supremacist? The God of a white supremacist is a white supremacist. They are their own gods. This is why they are very determined and very focused and very arrogant and very efficient when they get ready to do anything they have total confidence and they do not take kindly to any images of a god that does not look exactly like them they consider any other images as being inferior or non-existent okay so it's everything that a white supremacist does reinforces white supremacy they don't come around. They don't even come around black people unless they have that in mind. Or unless they Everything. have to. Unless they have to. Yes. And the only time they do, the only time they show up anywhere, it has something to do with the muscle of white supremacy. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, they're not going to show. Even when they come in the guise of doing other things, as people who are called Indians would testify, 
they'll say that they come here again with the words, the forked tongue. And they're very efficient. But I don't want to spend all of the day just talking about what they do. A lot of people are familiar with that. Uh, and a lot of people may not be. But I also want to emphasize what do you do, like we have touched on some things. Yes. In every instance, meaning in every situation that you're in, there should be a prescribed way. That's the one thing that black people do not have is a codified way of handling every situation, not some, not guesswork, not shuffling and head scratching and wondering what to do or what to say, but precision work. That's the one thing that's missing. That's the one thing that has been missing ever since everybody started trying to deal with racism. It's important to just understand all of the things that the white supremacists do, because anything that you miss, that whatever you miss about the way they go about doing things, that's what's going to uh, eventually trip you up. They already know that. I mean, the system of white supremacy is very, very, very finely tuned, like a smooth-running automobile engine. It's very fine-tuned, and they're always checking to see that that engine is running smoothly. If they hear any rattles or anything, I mean, they go and check on it immediately because it's not supposed to happen. I mean, they want a smooth operation. And the refinement stage of white supremacy means they do it so smoothly that the average black person, the average non-white person will say, white supremacy, that doesn't exist. Oh, what, what's that fool talking about? What are these stupid people talking about some white supremacy? I do what I want to do. Mm -hmm. I go where I want to go. Don't nobody tell me what to do. You know, so then the white supremacy was to look at that black person and say, that's exactly the way we want all of them to think, that we don't even exist. Mm. That wow. everything, you know, that, that they're running everything, that black people run the world. That's the way we want them to think. That is the ultimate in the refinement stage of white supremacy. See, white supremacy goes through four stages. The first stage is establishment. I don't know when it was established. Some people say 600 years ago. Some people say 400 years. Some people say, no, 2,000 years. Then there are other people, depending on what scholar you talk to, say, oh, no, 6,000 years. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's when they really got established, 6,000 years ago. All right? That's a long time. Now, I say I don't know, but I do know that they are in business now the biggest business on earth. No business is bigger than that, the system of white supremacy. Okay. So I'm saying, I don't know when it's established, but it was established. Otherwise, we wouldn't be having this conversation. That's the right. one. Okay. And then the second stage is maintenance. Just like anything that you start, you want to maintain it. You want to go around, you know, if you put together a, uh, an aircraft or something like that, you come around and check if you put together an air conditioning system or a plumbing system, you come and check it every now and then. See if it's running smoothly. Mm -hmm. That's what you call maintenance. Okay. Yeah, you, okay. You, you, yeah, you see that everything is in place. And then expansion is when you take in more people. The that, expansion. That's the third stage? Supremacy. And there's more people on the planet now than there was, say, 10,000 years ago or 200 years ago. More people on the planet and most of them are non-white. So you're getting more and more people, you know, as your capital, you might say, in your business. You're getting taken in more and more slaves because they're being born. More people are being born all the time, mm -hmm. and they're being yeah. born in your prison. All right, that makes your prison expand. All right, you make more room for them in your prison. Okay, and then the last stage, and this is the stage they want to stay in, refinement. You make your prison look like it's not a prison where the prisoners are concerned. Now you've got a smooth operation situation. Okay. All right? Where you have wow. people walking around saying, nobody tells me what to do. I'm my own man. I'm, I'm 21 years old. I'm grown. All right? I ain't no child. I mean, you know, I go and, I go and do what I please, when I please, when, you know, whatever I please. Mm -hmm. And have the... Uh, non-white females doing the same thing. Okay. That's a per per perfect situation for a prison master. Okay, let me get this straight. Establishment, maintenance, expansion, and refinement. Establishment, maintenance, 
expansion, and refinement. Okay. Now, they are trying to stay in the wow. refinement state. Wow. Mm-hmm. But, you know, a lot of black people are saying, wait a minute. <laughs> We're in a system of racism. You can't fool me about that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, hey, racism does exist. Okay. Racism is real. Racism is real. Now, you got a whole lot of black people who are saying that now. Okay. Not all over the world. Not near as many as should be. Nowhere near as many. Okay. But you have a substantial number. All now, right. that disturbs the white supremacist business. Because in the refinement stage, you're not supposed to be aware that there is such a thing as racism. Correct, correct. All right, they're supposed to be so smooth, so they are arguing among themselves now, the white supremacists are. Mm-hmm, okay. And see, I mean, I told you to keep this thing in the refinement stage. Now, you've got others that are saying, no, it's kind of getting out of hand. we got to start using the hammer and the fist. Mm. we got to start gunning them down, mm. like we did in the old wow. days. we got to right. be right in their face 24 hours a day. Okay. They said, yeah, that'll work for a little while, but all that'll do is stir them up. Yeah. You don't want to stir them up. You don't want to woke them up. Let these Negroes slip on. <laughs> don't woke them up. Let them slip on. Mm-hmm. Okay. All right, keep oh. them asleep. Okay. That's refinement stage. Refinement. That way you can, you can lay down and go to sleep, and they'll be waiting on you hand and foot, thinking that they're serving each other, mm. thinking that they're serving themselves. Mm-hmm. That's what you want, a smooth-running yeah. machine. All right. There is a system of white supremacy, which is racism, which is designed to do what? dominate and mistreat people of color. Anybody who is classified as black, brown, red, yellow, tan, beige, has a little bit of color in his or her skin, or somebody said that they did, even if a person looks white, but they say that, well, you got a, you got a, you know, great, 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 great grandmother that had some color, all right? Oh, okay. Well, they're in the mistreatment category, right? Yep. Those are the people that you're supposed to mistreat because they got color in their skin. You know, if they got color in their skin, they're supposed to be mistreated. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, something is out of order if they're not being mistreated now. you got to mistreat those people that's got color in their skin. Well, uh, uh, why is that? You know, because I said so. Mm. Is that the reason? Yeah. That's all it took. That's all it took. Wow. And it's a lot of benefits that go with it. See? It's a lot of benefits that go with that. Mistreating mm-hmm. people based on color. Having a whole category of people. Black, brown, red, yellow, tan, beige. Just have some color in their skin. And you can do anything <laughs> you want to with that person. And nobody's supposed to say anything about it. Isn't that a wonderful proposition? Have somebody wait on you hand and foot. Do whatever you say do. Think the way you want them to think on the kind of the color of their skin. Don't you think that that's a wonderful thing to have when you got millions of people like that right there at your beck and call? Ain't that wonderful? Yeah, well, that, yeah, but that, uh, you know, that, that sounds like that ain't right. Well, we're not talking about right and wrong now. We're talking about what's convenient. Oh, well, it is convenient. Well, then, that's all we need to think about, what's mm-hmm. convenient. Mm-hmm. All right? I mean, that's natural. That's normal. People like to do what's convenient, and racism is convenient for any person classified as white. All right? End of story. Period. And so the average white person takes a look at that and say, well, what if we didn't have racism? then uh, that means you don't have a category of people that you can mistreat and get away with. Do anything you want to with. Use any kind of way you want to. Mm-hmm. Don't pay them. Don't pay them at all. I mean, you know, you going to give that up? Give it up for what? What are you going to have if you give it up? Well, you got a point there. Yeah, I'll go with racism. So the average white person has every incentive to be a racist. I see. Okay. That's the bottom line that I want to, you know, get to. Get, mm-hmm. okay. Every white person, when given that kind of option, do you want the option of having people at your beck and call, people kissing your foot anytime you tell them to, and it ain't nothing they can do about it except kiss it? Isn't that a convenience? Well, you put it that way, it is. Hmm. Now, you want to give it up and just have to everybody equal, which means... You're going to have to work harder. You ain't got nobody to push around. 
when you get mad, you don't have nobody that you can go over to cross town and kick or shoot mm-hmm. and whatnot. Mm-hmm. You just have to try to work it out. I mean, you don't have that convenience, you know. Well, yeah, I see your point. I see your point. Yes, I see your point. That's a wonderful point. Well, I know it ain't right, but it's convenient, like you say, and we'll worry about the right later. <laughs> I mean, you know. Okay. I mean, if ever. If ever. And that's all racism is, folks. Okay. That's all it is. It's a super convenience. You're if done. you're white. The most ignorant about racism are the victims. Okay. This is why they haven't overcome it. Black people do not have racism as their priority. And, and when, wake up every morning thinking about how they're going to get rid of racism. The average black person on the planet wakes up in the morning thinking about what? Well, they may be thinking about a lot of things, but they're not thinking about getting rid of racism. And that's what exactly every black person on this planet should wake up in the morning thinking about and go to bed thinking about Mm -hmm. each and every day with each and every breath that he or she takes. Mm -hmm. But we got every kind of nonsensical priority other than that. Okay. Yet we complain about our condition. And that is the reason we're in this condition because we got every other kind of priority. Now, one of the main priorities among black people is what? Showing off. Showing off. Showing off to whom? Yes, you've mentioned Each that. Each other. Mm-hmm. Yes. If we tell the truth, that is our priority. Okay. It's trying to figure out a way to show off, even if showing off just means driving by and shooting at somebody. Yes. Yeah, That's sure. showing off. Okay. But I've been saying, but, you know, people, people have a tendency to, you know, just, it's habit. That's what it is. You, you usually think the same way you've always thought. Even when somebody is telling you something different, you're really tuning it out and thinking the way you always thought, which is okay, because at some point you might choose to think differently or look at things a different way. I have been saying we are already a captured people. The war is still going on, by the way. Because what is a war? It's nothing but conflict that that continues. So as long as you have people resisting their captivity, the war is still going on. When people stop resisting, then that war is over. But the war between those who believe in racism and those who don't, so far, the victims of that war, the non-white people of this entire planet, have been prisoners of war. The white supremacists are not trying to capture black people. Black people are already captured and have been for generations. We are already prisoners of war. We are already in the prison called the entire planet because the white supremacists dominate every non-white person on this planet 24 hours a day in every area of activity. So we are already prisoners of that war. And so, therefore, we just keep asking the warden, not to do this and not to do that, Black Lives Matter and all like that. They're not walking around saying, you know, you know, we matter. Uh, yes, they'll say it. I mean, in a joking fashion, but the white supremacists say we're the only people that matter. I mean, you people are nothing but prisoners. And I do what, what I want to with all of you, not some of you, all of you. It's none of you who are exempt from me, who are exempt from my captivity. So... Uh, but you try to break out the prison, you want to change the prison into some Garden of Eden or something like that, and you can attempt that, but I will continue to do what I do until I decide I'm not going to do it anymore. And that's the status where we are right now. That's Mm -hmm. the white supremacist voice talking. Look at what people like myself are doing, or anybody who's talking about racism or talking about producing justice, heaven forbid, They are against it, but they will permit you to talk about it as long as what? Since they are very logical, very smart, as long as you are not effective. Okay. Now, when people listen to Neely Fuller talk, they just say, oh, yeah, that brother, he's okay. I mean, you know, and all like that. But business as usual. They'll go right back doing the same things they've always done. You know, everybody does the same thing. We will continue what we call our traditional black culture, 
which is a failed culture, by the way. The evidence shows this. That's what black culture is. It's a failed culture. It hasn't solved our problems. Mm -hmm. You know, we hadn't added any new dimensions to it. It's still the same basic culture that we have always had. The white supremacists do not look at the speaker when black people are speaking to other black people. The black people look at the reaction to the speaker. See, that's their pattern. That's right. their logic. Yes, sir. And it's, and it's the logic that makes sense. See what I mean? You know, you don't care what somebody says as long as nobody's changing, as long as nobody's doing anything different, just going through that same routine, celebrating the same things and all like that. Yes, sir. I mean, you know, looking forward to the same things. And so they just go out and take a look at what black people are doing out here slaughtering each other all over South Side Chicago. And they say, yeah. who cares about what Neely Fuller says or anybody else? You know, black people still act the same. They don't change. They still want. How you figure that, man? Look around you, man. They own this shit. They own this couch you sitting on. Them shoes you got on your feet. This building. This school. This country. You. We're behind enemy lines, dog. One beat down and never compared to 439 years of captivity. Never. You don't know shit. Fresh. The system of white supremacy, according to all the evidence, is a complete system meaning that it is a world prison, a world prison, and who are the prisoners? The prisoners is everybody on the planet who is classified as and functions as, quote, unquote, non-white, black, brown, red, yellow, tan, beige, anybody who has color, in his or her skin. That's the criteria. That's the basic criteria for racism. Now, everybody who is classified as non-white is in the prison of white supremacy. And if you can put in your mind a prison, if you are an inmate of a prison, you are automatically serving the prison system. If you are a prisoner in a prison system, you are automatically, regardless of whether you want to be there or not, you are serving the purposes of the prison system if you are a prisoner in the prison system. Kindergarten. That's the way it works. It's no way to be a prisoner in a prison system without serving the prison system. So this thing of trying to find out which black person is a bigger prisoner than the other black person is folly. It's folly because it's not logical. Everything in counter-racist science, like everything in racist science, is based on logic. Because logic is the only thing that's going to be successful. So that's why I'm saying it's useless to talk about which prisoner is rendering more service to the prison system. Some prisoners, just like on the slave ship, some people who are on a slave ship, were taken up on deck. The sailors, the prison masters, the ship masters, would come down the ladder and say, you, you, and you, I'm going to take the chains off of you right now, and you're going up on deck. And so you go up on deck. Now, you can refuse to go and get beaten, 
and get beaten and beaten until you finally do go or until they just get tired of beating you because you are unconscious now and useless. So they get somebody else. But somebody's going. Why? Because you can do that when you are the master of a ship and you have cargo on the ship, slaves that have no place to go, wouldn't know how to go if they could get off the ship, and even if they took over the ship, wouldn't know how to run it. So what do they do? Just like all black people do, just like I do every day. Do what the slave master tells me to do. That goes to show the awesome power of the system of white supremacy. Sometimes some of us, by looking at the other slaves on the ship, get the idea that we're not on the slave ship too. And that we are slaves, equal slaves. Now, sometimes we get the impression that we are not. Because I still give that slave ship analogy, making it the prison analogy, because it's the same thing. Prison, slaves, slaves, prison, same thing. All right. So one slave says to the other, you know, you got the incorrect attitude. We're both slaves, but you don't have any dignity. And other slaves say, yeah, you say that I'm silly. Say, yeah, you are silly and I'm dignified. So that raises a question based on logic. What is the difference between a dignified slave and a silly one? And the answer is, one is dignified and one is silly. And that's the only difference. See, the white supremacists work in package deals. They think of everything, not of one thing. They think of every move that a black person is ever going to make. It's like studying the chessboard or the checkerboard. An excellent checker player knows where you're going to move before you move. That's what makes an excellent checker player. And the white supremacists have turned out to be the greatest chess and checker players that the world has ever seen. Why? Because they know what a black person is going to do before the black person knows that he or she is going to do it himself. I mean, they sit back and laugh at us all the time. They say, you know, they call us that name. That N word, they say, I already know what that N is going to do. He doesn't know that he's going to do it, but I know he's going to do it because I know how he thinks. I know him better than he knows himself. So I know what he likes. I know what he doesn't like. I know how long he's going to work here. I know the day that I'm going to fire him before he even gets to the job. And I know how I'm going to fire him because I'm going to make him angry. And I'm going to say this and I'm going to say that. And among these people, I have studied them. They got a lot of what you call Negro pride or black pride. And so if you say this to them a certain way, they will curse you out and call you a bunch of MFs. They will do that. They can't help it. You owe me some money, motherfucker. And then you tell them you'll have to let them go. And then they will go. And then six months later, they will be back trying to get a job back because they will cool down. I already know that. And when he goes down there and tries to get a job from my brother, my brother has already been told that he's coming. So he'll turn him down. So he'll be right back here. And I'll tell him, yes, I'll hire you back at half of what you got before. How about it? Or you can go look for another job again until somebody decides to make you mad again because we know what will make you mad. We know what will make you mad. We know what will make you laugh. We'll have you laughing all over this place because you people love to laugh even when there's nothing to laugh at. We know that because we trained you that way like you train a dog. Black people talk most, mostly to each other in order to, uh, to argue. That's really why they're talking. They don't know this, but that's why they're talking. They're not trying to learn nothing. They're not, you know, they're just trying to, like I said in the book, 
uh, show offism. They're trying to show how much they have learned from white people. But they're trying to show it to another black person because it doesn't make sense to show it to a white person. Because that's just who, that's just who told them. What do you think a black person is doing when they walk around waving their degree? I hear some black uh, professors and whatnot. I mean, stand up talking about, you know, how much they have learned, you know, and how degreed they are and all like that. And then turn right around and start talking about dumb white folks. And that's who gave them their degree. They came a long distance, some of them all the way from Nigeria someplace, trying to learn. Learn from who? Me? No, they passed right by me. That's the one intelligence that they have. <laughs> how many black people, how many uh, black people do you see? And I'll go further than that. How many white people do you see? Following black people all over the world, trying to learn how to get to the moon. That's not where you go. doesn't work. Anybody who will tell the truth know that don't work. I know some non-white people who would say there are white people who are not smart. Uh, I, in fact, just heard a whole them. lot of them, and they're correct. I'm going to join right in for you even uh, go that way. Yes, a whole lot of white people who don't know a whole lot of things. But you, you know what? Under the system of white supremacy, they know enough. Because they don't have to know. And what is that enough? Something I heard a white woman say one time. <laughs> a bunch of black people were, were laughing at her because they were laughing at the way that she dressed. He was talking about how tacky she was at the way that she dressed. This was on a job that I was on. They were getting on the elevator and they were just, they were cracking up at the way that she was dressed. Because she was dressed in what most people would say in an outlandish manner. This outlandish, okay? Like she had gone out of her way to attract a whole lot of laughter, okay? But she heard them laughing at her. And she turned around and said one thing. Yes, but I'm white. <laughs> and walked off. Wow. In what other words, y'all can laugh at me and dress in all your fine clothes and all like that, but I can do things that you would never do in your entire life. I can wow. go places. I got connections that you would never have. No matter, your children would never have. That's what she was saying. That was back in the 60s. Those black people on that elevator got dead quiet. Wow. Because they knew that she was telling the truth. Say, yeah, I can dress any cotton picking way I want to. <laughs> but you got no right to laugh at me. Because when you look at my overall circumstances and yours, no contest. <laughs> That's what she was wow. saying in just that one statement. Now, she didn't say all that. She just made one statement. But I was standing nearby. I knew exactly what it meant. <laughs> yeah, wow. but I'm white, you know. I don't have to dress no kind of way. I don't even have to have clothes on. I'm, st I'm still in a league better than you. I got connections better than you'll ever have. Right. Wow. Yeah. So to all y'all on that elevator, I mean, just get on it, close the door, and go straight to the ghetto. <laughs> uh, particularly in job situations, uh, they set black people up. They, one thing, well, many white supremacists have concluded that in most cases, or in many cases, uh, black people, non-white people, act according to their emotions. So they know what but buttons to push. They they just about know when they're going to fire you and how they're going to go about doing it because they know when they're going to make you angry. They know how to make you angry. They know how to make you laugh. They know how to get you to relax. They know how to get you uptight. So they say, okay, well, we're going to get rid of that fellow today. So we'll have him come in, 
and uh, we'll uh, start telling him this and telling him that and whatnot. We got our own strategies and whatnot, and uh, we have been studying him, and we know that he has a temper. So at this point, this one thing, because white supremacists always study their victims, and they know more about their victims than the victims know about themselves. All right, they, the white supremacists know more about me than I will ever know about myself. All right, they make it their business to do that. So they can kind of predict behavior. And in job situations, when they get ready to get rid of a non-white person, they'll say, hey, what we'll do, we'll make him mad. Because we know what will make him mad. So, you know, about 9 o'clock today, when he does, does this and does this and whatnot, you go over and say to him this, 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 and this. Now that'll get him angry. And he's going to immediately blow up. He's going to start calling names and all like that. And today, by 5 o'clock, he'll be fired. So we'll just set him up Shame. for that. He'll walk right into the Shame. trap. He won't Shame. be expecting it. And this happens all the time. Yes. See what I mean? So non-white people should be aware of this. Okay. When they get ready to get rid of you, everything is just fine. But now he's got a cousin that needs your job. And he says, hey. Well, Henry, I mean, you know, that black guy down there, he's got that position, and he's doing an excellent job and all like that. Say, well, but my cousin needs that job. So how are we going to get rid of Henry and do it all nice and neat? Say, well, we'll make him angry. So you know how these people are. You know, they always got a chip on their shoulder and whatnot. They always want somebody to respect them. Mm -hmm. the They're respect? real big on respect. So you say something that sounds like you're disrespecting him, he's going to go off. It's not going to be disrespect, because these black people don't even know what respect is. See, they just know what we have told them. So they set them right. up, huh? They don't have a definition for respect. Mm -hmm. They think they do, okay? So we'll, you know, we'll have them play in our hands, just like they do with everything that we relate to them. That's why we are dominant. That's why we are white supremacists. And that's why they're always victims, because they do not think ahead, you know. They only think about how they feel at the moment, and we'll always use that against them, because they're very emotional people, you know. Mm. They fly off the handle real quick, hmm. see what I mean? But you got to know what buttons to push, and we know what buttons to push, because we understand them better than they understand themselves. You're being set up, yeah. Mm. You know, when you run the kindergarten, I mean, you know your children, all right? And that's what the white supremacists look at the whole world of non-white people. They say, we know how to move these people around. They don't even know they're being moved around. <laughs> you know, we know how to, you know, set them up for, have, make them laugh, make them laugh like you wouldn't believe. And we know how to make them mad. I mean, just have them, I mean, storming around the place, knocking things over. We know how to do that. See? So we'll just orchestrate it. Anytime we want them to do anything, I mean, we know how to handle them. They don't know anything about how to handle us, even though they think they do. That's why they're in the position that they're in, and we're in the position that we're in. We are white supremacists, and they are victims of white supremacy, just like all their ancestors, because they didn't know anything either. Produce poison, you get some of it on, your, on it yourself. That Going back to the way this program started today and the way it starts uh, on many occasions, we start with that scene from The Godfather. What did The Godfather say sitting there at the table with Barzini and the Natalias and the rest of the criminal families? He said, this drug business, it will destroy us said, you're talking about keeping it among the black people up there in Harlem, among the coloreds. Let them destroy themselves. They're nothing but animals anyway. That's what you're saying. But you don't understand the nature of drugs. The next thing you know, our own children will be using it. And that's what I don't want to be a part of. That's what, that's what Don Corleone was saying to the Barzinis and the Tatalias. And that's what happens in the system of white supremacy. But the system of white supremacy also is set up on a percentage basis so that the 
the real smart white supremacists have said, oh, yeah, of course, we're going to have some white sacrifices in our army. We're going to have to sacrifice some of our own people. Some of our own children are going to get caught up in nonsense. But we will still have the basic power. We will never let those black people start doing anything constructive on a scale where we can't control them. So we will do it on a percentage basis. For every 10,000 of them who is all messed up, we will probably have maybe a couple of thousand or maybe 500 of our own that are all messed up. But percentage-wise, we are always hold the power, hold the reins of what goes on in the world. The cost of the, doing the business of white supremacy is going up simply because most of the dark people, or many of the dark people on the planet, now are becoming smarter and more constructive than they ever have been before. So the more constructive, the smarter, and that's, that's what you mean by smart, uh, in a constructive sense rather than a destructive sense, Many people all over the world now, when you look at the dark-skinned people of the world, the non-white people, many of them are beginning to think about doing something, breaking away from their old habits and doing something constructive and thinking constructively, trying to learn how to do things that will have a constructive result. Now, this is always bad for the criminal enterprise called white supremacy. This is always very uh, uh, foreboding to them. They have got to modify what they do because they are being forced to. So that means more white sacrifices. So you'll see more white people out here doing simple-minded things, I mean, but not on such a grand scale that the entire system of white supremacy comes apart. Interesting. If, if it starts heading toward that tipping line, mm -hmm. See, they know where that tipping line is. They will open up on black people like you wouldn't believe. What do you mean I by mean, open? When you say open up. I mean open up with, with wholesale violence to put us in our place. Say, look, you, you're getting too far out of hand now. You're being too, uh, you are not supposed to be a constructive people. So I am going to drop a bomb on you or whatever it is. But you are not going to be a constructive people as long as you are destructive. Fine, as long as you're doing what you do in Rwanda and what these gangs do over here in this area of the world and all like that, just going running around with machetes and whatnot, slaughtering each other, no problem. That's We love that. That's entertainment for us. As long as you're using drugs and selling drugs to each other and glorifying it and all like that and then killing each other because of the drugs, that's fine. As long as you're riding around on bicycles or drive-by shootings and whatnot and robbing people and whatnot, I mean, that's fine. We all endorse that. That's what we want you to do. You're, you're nothing but trash anyway. We will want to see you a trashy people. We don't want to see you doing anything constructive unless it's something constructive for us, we white supremacists, because we will make you do what is constructive for us. This is why the pretty buildings and the pretty neighborhoods are all where we are. You know that because we see to it that it's that way. But wherever you are, we want you to just tear it up, break it up, put graffiti all over the place, write graffiti even on yourselves in the form of what they call tattoos. Just walk around looking like zombies. I mean, just wild, broken glass, broken heads, broken bodies, yellow tape all over the place, blinking lights. Wherever you find black people, you see as soon as it gets dark, blinking lights all over the place, uh, cartridges. Nine millimeters lying all over the place with yellow circles around them. How many shots were fired? Mm -hmm. You know, uh, that's 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 what you call the typical black life. That's black culture. That's black culture at its very best, and that's which means that it's just about all of black culture. Wherever you go in the world, that's what you'll see. Whenever you see black people, this is what you're going to see. Nothing constructive going on at all. That's the way we want it. And when they start showing signs of being constructive, oh, that's bad for our business. That's bad for our business. So that's not a good business model for white people. No, supremacy. that's not a business model for black people at all. No, they are breaking out of their, no, no, we can't have that. 
they're doing something constructive, get down there and start some mess mm. as fast as you can. And we know how to do that. That's heavy. We white supremacists. Now, some people have said they've seen some cartoons of my work uh, on the Internet that have been presented. And that uh, it, it pretty well embellishes what I have been trying to say in my textbooks. And uh, to the extent that it does that, well, that has been... From what I understand, some people reported to me a plus, because they didn't understand what I had written very well, but when they saw those cartoons that just repeated what I was saying and attaching my name to it and uh, came right out of the book, the material did, uh, they say that they better understood it. And I can understand that because... People are kind of visual, particularly in the year 2021 now, uh, more visual than ever. People are used to looking at things on the screen. The white supremacists who own everything, by the way, that's what they call ownership. Mm -hmm. Really, they stole it all, okay, because that's how they got their 